Hi there, and welcome to this Bristol Bristol lecture. It's great to see a really full house now um, for what is going to be a really awesome lecture. So um, my name's Alex, I'm one of the organisers. I'm one of the um, full-time officers at the University of Bristol Students' Union who's co-hosting this event with the university. And it's my pleasure now to introduce Alex Charles, who's from the Engineering Design Society, um, who we're doing this lecture in partnership with, and he's going to introduce our lecture today. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Um, yeah, so the Engineering Design Society, a brand new society, we began this year, and our aim is to unite all five years of the Engineering Design cohort. We're really small, there's only a hundred of us, but we've never had this in place before, so it's a really fantastic opportunity. So we aim to do this through facilitating a network and by providing a platform for our members to be able to put forward their great ideas. After hearing the rebirth for the Best of Bristol Lecture Series, we were very excited for the opportunity to hear from world-class lecturers across the various departments of the University of Bristol. Naturally, the Engineering Design Society jumped at the opportunity to promote one of our favourite lecturers. She's not only fantastic at making lectures fun, but also has been a great inspiration to many students to get on board with the space industry. Lucy began her space career at Bristol and has since worked for the European Space Agency, NASA and BAE Space Systems, before becoming a lecturer back in 2009. Whilst here, she's worked with a range of research topics, including a device to deploy more than 50 cube satellites. And today, we are lucky enough to hear an invigorating talk on the best-selling show, Is There Life on Mars? I'm very happy to hand over to Lucy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. And I'd also like to thank the rest of the Engineering Design Society for proposing me for this. And a huge thank you to the Bob Committee who've put an immense amount of work uh, into putting on this lecture series for you. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you today about the best-selling show, Is There Life on Mars? Some of you may rec uh, recognize the David Bowie quote. And uh, I take no credit for being here today. Uh, being here today, thank you, um, because I just happened to teach a really exciting uh, subject, which is uh, spacecraft systems design. Uh, so this is me coming to work uh, in the mornings. <laughs> I don't know why you're laughing. This is me going home in the evenings tired but happy. Uh, I also have uh, another job and that is I work in a spacecraft design company one day a week as well called Thales Alenia Space and I'm going to talk a little bit about the work I do there as well a bit later on. But first of all I would like to ask you, do you think there is life on Mars? Could we have a show of hands if you think there is life on Mars, okay? Uh, it could be microbial life, any sort of life at all. Okay, I would say that is uh, maybe a third of the audience. Thank you very much. Okay, and I'm not going to answer that question today, I'm afraid. <laughs> there is no yes or no answer. Uh, there's no straightforward answer to this yet. But what we can do is look at the Mars environment, uh, is, it is it habitable, uh, is it hospitable towards life? Uh, we can look at getting to Mars, how difficult it actually is to send spacecraft to Mars. We can look at the spacecraft that have actually been to Mars and the evidence that they have collected. And one of the most uh, interesting ways of getting evidence back to the Earth where we can apply our really sophisticated equipment to it uh, is to do a Mars sample return mission. And I'm going to mention that as well. Uh, then, because it's been in the news so much recently, I cannot uh, avoid talking about human missions to Mars. And it may be that that is the only way that we see life on Mars. <clears throat> okay, so let's start with the Mars environment. And I want you to look at this picture, which is my background. 
Uh, this is a picture taken from a Mars orbiting spacecraft as it skims across the surface of Mars. Okay, and you can see in the distance the sun uh, in the background there. And I want you to compare that with this next image. Okay, so have this picture in your mind. The next image is a similar picture uh, from the Earth. Okay, so we're skimming now across the surface of the Earth and looking towards the sun. So one of the things that you should notice is that the size of the sun, the size of the sun is so much greater because the Earth is nearer to the sun. This is a really concrete reminder that we have the benefit of the sun on the Earth. We're much closer. We have much more warmth. Mars is a much colder, deader world than uh, the Earth. Okay, another big difference uh, is... Let's see if I can get this. Ah, is this precious thin blue line we have there. And that is our wet and dense atmosphere. Uh, if we go back to the picture of Mars... You can see Mars has very little atmosphere. It's a very thin, tenuous, light atmosphere. Now, the combination of those two, those two things, the warmth from the sun and the density of our atmosphere and its moistness means that we can have liquid water on the surface of the Earth. And that is one of the prerequisites for life. That's what the astrobiologists uh, are telling us. Okay, so let's look at the, uh, some other conditions of Mars compared to the Earth. Mars has much lower uh, pressure, atmospheric pressure. So it's less than a hundredth that of Earth's atmospheric pressure. Uh, it has a very low temperature, as we've already said, and it has a poisonous atmosphere. So it's mainly carbon dioxide, certainly poisonous to life as we know it, and nitrogen and a bit of argon. It has really high levels of radiation on the surface of Mars. Okay, so you, you and I don't really want to be hanging out on the surface of Mars. On the positive side, and this will be good if we ever want to colonize Mars, the length of day for Mars is very similar to that of the Earth. Uh, it also has a similar kind of axial tilt, so the poles are tilted over at the same kind of angle uh, as the Earth. And this means that Mars has seasons, just like us. They're slightly longer because Mars takes longer to go on its orbit around the sun than the Earth does. <clears throat> Okay, so what do we need for life? We need favorable environmental conditions, as we've already looked at. Uh, we also need three other things, and this is the first of them. Uh, we need the raw materials and nutrients that can be me metabolized to build new cells. So this is like the food. We then need a source of energy. Okay, this could be the sun, it could be energy from uh, chemical reactions, uh, it could be radiation, uh, all forms of energy. We then need liquid water. Okay, so those three things are prerequisites for life as we, as we know it so far. Okay, now I'm going to look at getting to Mars. Getting to Mars is hard. Okay, okay. Um, there used to be a spacecraft engineer's joke that uh, there was a curse on Mars, a bit like the actor's joke that there's a curse on performing Macbeth. Well, there's a spacecraft engineer's joke about Mars, and they, we used to say that uh, the Martians were sabotaging our missions. <laughs> okay. Um, you can see that out of 41 missions... Uh, 24 have failed. That's not good, is it? 24 out of 41. And 17 have been successful. Now, most of the more recent missions have been successful, so we are getting better at going to Mars. But it is not easy. Well, why is it not easy? Uh, if we look at how we get to Mars, you can't actually aim at Mars and go straight there because Mars is traveling slower around its orbit than the Earth is. 
So what you have to do is you have to wait for a launch window. You might have to wait for up to 26 months for a launch window, which then opens only for a few days. <clears throat> so you have to then set off from the Earth here. This is our spacecraft in green going around there. You have to have your Mars ahead of you. So the planets have to be in exactly the right position. Mars has to be ahead. Then you set off. It'll take you seven months to get there. And then, if you want to come back, uh, then you've got to hang out on, on Mars for three to four months before another launch window to come back opens again. So you've got a minimum stay on Mars of three to four months. And then you've got your seven-month uh, return journey. Okay, so all together, we've got a minimum uh, return mission time of a year and a half if we want to send humans and bring them back again. So, what are the spacecraft that have already been to Mars? I'm going to start with the landers. Oh, sorry. Okay, so we started off in the 70s with the Viking landers, and uh, then uh, went on, then NASA sent the Mars Pathfinder mission, and this is the Sojourner rover. This was the one that inspired me when I was a budding spacecraft engineer. Uh, then in 2003, there was the most advantageous launch window for 60,000 years. Can you imagine? Uh, it just happened to be in 2003. And uh, we sent up... Uh, a European mission, the first European Space Agency interplanetary mission uh, that was ever sent. And I was lucky enough to be involved, so that was very exciting for me. Um, NASA also sent two rovers. Uh, there they are, the Spirit and Opportunity rover. The Opportunity is still working today, uh, which is pretty fantastic. The uh, European mission, you'll see in a minute, um, and in 2007, there was the Phoenix lander that was sent to near the Martian uh, North Pole. And then in 2011, most recently, the Curiosity lander, which we've been he hearing quite a lot about uh, in the news recently. And that's a little selfie that Curiosity's done by pointing the robot arm and a camera on the end of the robot arm. Okay, so I've mentioned landers. There's also a bit of a traffic jam in Mars orbit at the moment. There's five Earth spacecraft going around. So if you were a Martian, you really wouldn't want to come out. It's just like Big Brother watching you. And uh, one of them is Mars Express. And this is this European mission that I mentioned. If you haven't ever seen a spacecraft up close and personal, uh, they tend to look like a washing machine uh, wrapped up as a Christmas present. Uh, with wings. So this is one here. Uh, inside, let me show you the guts of a spacecraft uh, here. And I want you to particularly look at this collection of boxes there. And those were the scientific instruments. They still are. They're still operating in Mars orbit today. And um, they, they, they are composed of uh, cameras, spectrometers, radars, uh, magnetometers to measure the magnetic field, and so on. Okay, so those are the instruments that are going to be able to detect uh, the evidence about whether there might be life on Mars or not. Okay, so let's look at the evidence. Uh, one of the first things uh, that these spacecraft found was ice carbon dioxide ice and water ice, okay? And just to remind you how special carbon dioxide ice is, uh, I have some here. Now, I have to be very careful not to burn myself because this stuff is at um, minus 70 degrees. So I'm going to put on my bike glove here. <laughs> And I'm just going to pop some in. So carbon dioxide uh, is, is solid at uh, minus 70. And uh, what, what I want you to imagine when I do this is that you're at the Martian North Pole. So there's a cap of carbon dioxide, solid carbon dioxide at the Martian North Pole. When the first um, sun rays uh, from springtime come and touch on the Martian North Pole, then this is what you would see. Uh, let me just check it in. 
There we go. So this stuff coming out is uh, water vapor uh, as, the, as the carbon dioxide uh, condenses the water out of the, the air. Okay, so this is what, this causes massive dust storms uh, in the Martian springtime. I hope it's not destroying the webcam. <laughs> there we go. Better not kick it over either. Okay. So carbon dioxide has a strange property. It goes straight from, um, from a solid to a gas. That's why it's called dry ice. Uh, it's called subliming. And... Um, what this does at the Martian North Poles as well as causing massive dust storms and water vapor to be transported across the surface of Mars, it also causes these geysers uh, as the carbon dioxide tries to escape uh, through a thick cap. Okay, the other evidence uh, that we've found uh, is past liquid water. So we're pretty sure that there isn't any... Um, uh, long-standing uh, surface water on the surface of Mars. But there is evidence and increasing evidence of past liquid water. And so this is the scientific method. Each, with each mission, we gather more and more evidence. And each mission gives us more and more a picture of what, uh, what the geology of Mars is and so on. So we can build up a really consistent picture. It will confirm or negate the, the previous mission's findings. And so we can see here um, river deltas, stream beds, and gullies, uh, and those are all very similar to uh, water features on, on the Earth, so similar geologies to water features on the Earth. So if there isn't any liquid water on the surface of Mars, then we become interested in the subsurface of Mars because if we can have some water, some solid water ice as a permafrost beneath the Martian poles, which is what Mars Express found uh, in uh, 2005 or 6. Uh, there's about two or three kilometers thick of water ice underneath the Martian poles. Uh, then we suddenly have the exciting possibility of if there's uh, uh, some kind of hole or cave and there's some kind of heat, uh, whether it's um, generated uh, in, in different ways, uh, then we can have the possibility of a, an aquifer or a spring or a river. And this is what we need for life. We need some standing water uh, to be around for a few million years, possibly, for life to evolve. So this is some evidence uh, of organic molecules. So this is a picture from uh, a telescope, but there's also been other evidence from uh, spacecraft, and that is that there are clouds of methane release, released on Mars. They seem to come and go. They waft here and there, uh, and they, move, they change with the seasons. Uh, so that's very interesting. Uh, methane can be released biologically, as you know, um, but it can also be released geologically. So it's not a definite sign that there is life. Uh, another exciting result just in December last year from, was from the Mars Curiosity lander. And uh, here we have a blank sample. And this is a rock that um, Mars Curiosity analyzed. And these, these uh, molecules were uh, sort of contaminants. But these three molecules are organic molecules that the Mars uh, Curiosity rover found in a rock. So that was really exciting because they hadn't found any organic molecules in a rock before. <clears throat> organic molecules, as you probably know, uh, contain carbon and usually hydrogen as well. And they, they are uh, one of the building blocks for life. So we, we definitely need them if life is to exist. If they exist, it doesn't mean that life exists, but we need them to be there. Okay, so we've seen that we have the organic molecules, we have the raw materials. 
We have energy sources. There's plentiful energy sources on Mars. And we had liquid water in the past, and there may possibly be liquid water uh, currently in the subsurface of Mars. We're not sure about that yet. Okay? So uh, one, one thing that... Um, is fairly clear is that if there was any life on Mars, then it would almost certainly be microbial because it wouldn't have had time to evolve uh, into anything more advanced. Uh, if it was microbial, then it would also be uh, extremophile. That means it likes extreme conditions. And I'd like to show you as an example of an extremophile uh, I'd like to introduce you to something called the tardigrade. Now, don't let its cute, pudgy little face fool you. Uh, this thing can survive minus 200 degrees Celsius. It can survive 100 times the radiation that would kill a human. Uh, it can be found in the deepest... Um, ocean trench, the Mariana Trench uh, on the earth. Uh, so if you're still not impressed by that, then NASA actually chucked a few of them up into space and it survived um, 10 days of space vacuum. Okay. A force to be reckoned with. They're also called water bears. Isn't that cute? Water bears. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to touch on uh, Mars sample return now. Uh, one of the best ways of discovering whether there could be life on Mars is to do a sample return mission, i.e. to get a piece of Mars rock and bring it back to the Earth. And the reason we do that is that our instruments and equipment are more sophisticated on the Earth. If we did that, uh, then they would be brought back in a capsule like this. This capsule, uh, not many people have seen this picture. Um, this capsule has just been designed for the European Space Agency who are working on a Mars sample return mission, uh, which I'm slightly involved with. Uh, the bits of Mars rock would go in those kind of cylinders there. And then the capsule closes. It's put in a biocontainer, which we'll come to in a minute. And then the whole thing is put in the spacecraft. Okay, the spacecraft is then uh, shot off the surface of Mars uh, in a Mars Ascent vehicle. Now, this Mars Ascent vehicle is perhaps the most challenging part of the mission. Uh, but fortunately, rockets work along the same principles uh, on Earth, in a vacuum, underwater, if you want them to, and on Mars. Okay, and I've got a little demonstration now just to show you the principle of how a rocket works. And what I'm going to illustrate is Newton's third law. So it's the law of action and reaction. And uh, this is where I need my helpers. Um, and what I'm going to do is if I fire something in one direction, then uh, I'm going to hopefully go in another direction. Wish me luck. <coughs> Okay, I'm just going to uh, put a little bit of safety equipment on. Okay. Right. Um, as this is a rocket launch, uh, could I ask you for a countdown? Uh, could I ask you, you want to watch out, you guys? <laughs> uh, could I ask you for a five, four, three, two, one?
my goodness, I'm so glad that worked. <laughs> okay, so one of the things we have to do when we uh, send a mission to Mars is that we have to be really careful that we don't contaminate Mars, not just ethically, but because if we're going looking for life, we don't want to take life with us. So what we have to do is to clean the spacecraft and sterilize it. Not many people know this, that all of our spacecraft that are sent to Mars have to be sterilized. Equally, if we are bringing a, a sample back from Mars, then we have to be even more careful that we don't bring any life back, uh, any contamination back, and that we contain any um, potential Mars bugs or microbes in the sample itself so that we don't put life on Earth at risk. Okay, so uh, what I'm doing at the moment in industry is uh, we're helping, in a European-wide consortium, we're helping to design a facility which would house any Mars rocks that might be brought back to the Earth. And to do that, we're learning from two groups of people. Uh, The first are the good people at Porton Down, uh, who you may have heard of, who deal with uh, uh, lots of scary pathogens like uh, hemorrhagic fever, Um, smallpox, Ebola, and so on. So they have the expertise to be able to contain the Mars bugs uh, within a container. You can see here a very high biosafety containment level uh, facility, and the people in there have uh, suits with their own air supply so that uh, they don't get contaminated. We're also learning from um, these people here. This is the NASA Lunar Sample Laboratory. I actually worked in this building for a while. Um, And these people house uh, the Apollo moon rocks. So they're the ones who, uh, they stick their hands in those gloves and then they can manipulate the rocks without contaminating them with earth bugs. So they are experts at keeping the earth bugs out of samples. Nobody has ever had to do those two things together. So so it's quite an exciting project, and I'm sure that you want us all to do it properly. (laughs) Okay. So I'm going to touch on human missions to Mars. Uh, There are three different uh, missions to Mars at the moment that are in the offing. Uh, Firstly, there is the NASA International European Space Agency effort to put humans on Mars in the 2030s time frame. Uh, Then there is something which has been organized by a billionaire space tourist called Dennis Tito called Inspiration Mars, and he is hoping to send a couple of people round uh, Mars on a flyby so they won't land, and then they'll come back to Earth again in uh, sort of 2021. And then the one that you will have come across, and that is Inspiration, uh, sorry, Mars One, And that is a one-way trip to the Red Planet, uh, which has been in the news quite a lot recently. Okay, and what they're hoping to do is in 2024 to to send a crew of four off to uh, the Red Planet for uh, forever, basically. (laughs) They They are intending to start a colony there. Okay, so it's a sobering thought that when you get to Mars, this is what the Earth looks like, okay? It's actually a teeny, tiny blue dot there inside my white circle. So I'd like you to think, if you were there, would you feel more terrestrial from Earth, or would you feel more Martian? Uh, I'd like to ask you if you might be the future Martians. Okay, there's lots of young people here today. You might be going to spend a weekend with your grandchildren on Mars in the future. It's an amazing thought. I'd like to particularly address my my next words to the students in the audience. Could you put your hand up if you're a student? Wow, lots of you, fantastic. Okay, so the chief of NASA 
Uh, Charles Bolden uh, did a speech recently to some graduating students at the University of Michigan. Uh, you can find it on Space News if you want. Uh, it's really inspiring, and I'd like to use some of his words and address them to you. You are the space generation. You live in a world where astronauts from many nations fly together in space every single day. It's your generation that are going to land humans on Mars. So dream big dreams. Do what you want to do. Don't listen to anyone who tells you you can't do something or you don't belong. The best way to predict the future is to invent it. Okay, and with that, I'd like to close my talk and thank you all very much for listening. Anybody like to ask any questions? Yes, please. Okay, thank you. Can you say out of the dozens of landers that have gone on to Mars and the dozens that have crash land on Mars and the hundreds of instruments that have gone to Mars that they are 100% sterilized? That's, yes, it's a very good point. I think uh, they're not even supposed to be one. 100%, they're supposed to be 99.99%. <laughs> so, so, so there is life on Mars. <laughs> <laughs> so we have almost certainly taken a few, mm. a few little bugs with us. Uh, however, we do try to do our best, and there's uh, improving techniques, uh, including sort of vaporized hydrogen peroxide for cleaning the spacecraft. But yes, we can't be completely sure. Okay, thank you. What do you think happened to all the liquid water? Uh, so, yes, that's a really good question. So, Mars um, is now much more of a dead world than it used to be. It used to be warmer. It used to have um, a molten core. And uh, it's, it's slowly cooled down. And at that time when it had a molten core and a magnetic field and um, an atmosphere then it could have, it was con the right conditions for liquid water. But as now it has no mag magnetic field, then the solar wind strips off uh, the atmosphere and it means that uh, there is a great deal of radiation and uh, there was, we are now in a condition where we can't have liquid water. It's too cold and so on. Thank you. Uh, we have one there. Hi, I'm just wondering, where are we going to get the fuel to uh, power all these spacecrafts to Mars? Because there's a problem already, as is, with the fuel that we are using for our business here in this planet. I'm all pro sending spacecrafts full of people there, but have you sorted out a way of doing it without actually destroying our resources? Uh, that, I think this is a very serious point. Do, in general, do we want to be putting money into a space program? You can imagine I'm slightly biased on that question. Um, in terms of fuel, one of the most efficient fuels is a combination of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, which is, is not too uh, noxious for us. Um, one of the biggest challenges is to take the fuel to Mars to do the Mars return. Uh, that is one of the most difficult technical challenges, and therefore people have spent a lot of time trying to work out how to make fuel once you're on Mars, and that's called in situ resource utilization. So that's uh, an interesting challenge that we have to make fuel on Mars with Mars resources. And the next question near the back. Uh, hello there. Uh, ooh, um, I'm just wondering uh, how much it's going to cost in order to spend, you know, um, human missions to Mars and where the money is going to come from because um, sending spacecraft to Mars costs money. So, Do you mean for the human missions? Oh, um, sort of human missions and spacecraft programs in general as well. In general. Well, I think that's a very good point. Um, 
So the mission that I was involved with, uh, they said to us, uh, you can give us the spa best spacecraft you can for 60 million. And we said, what? Because 60 million at that time seemed like very little. The um, Rosetta spacecraft, I think, cost nearer um, a thousand million, so a billion. And uh, a similar Mars spacecraft was built for 500 million. So uh, it is possible to reduce the costs. You certainly wouldn't want to be reducing the costs if you're sending humans. That's the time when you want to be spending a little bit more to ensure their safety. But I don't have an answer. That's, that's a question for the governments, really, where to find the money. <laughs> uh, gentleman over here. Um, the only known planet uh, currently, sorry, the only known planet that we, we know that life has arisen on is Earth. And obviously you, you speak about finding the necessary requirements for life on Mars, such as liquid water and um, evidence of uh, organic molecules. Uh, are you Presumably you're also uh, open to the possibility that life has arisen in, in fundamentally different ways. Um, are, you, are you looking for, for evidence of that as well? Sorry, could you repeat the last part of that for me? Are you open to uh, the possibility that life has arisen in fundamentally different ways from uh, that on, on Earth? And are you looking for, for other types of evidence? Well, that, that is a, a, a very good question because um, we are at the moment designing for carbon-based life forms. So we are aware of the fact that there could be silicon-based life forms. There could be uh, different kinds of life. And the more we learn, the more we realize that uh, life is more diverse and cleverer than we ever thought possible. So that it feels like the goalposts are moving all the time. But that means the equipment is getting wider uh, in terms of its application than uh, it has been before. The more we know, the more we can look for. So we're constantly um, opening our boundaries towards wider possibilities. But we do. We only have one example to go from. So it, it, that is a problem. Thank you. Perhaps we'll have just one more question. Yeah. Do you think there could be any advantages um, of sending life on this planet onto Mars to investigate how it survives, such as that creature you had? Or, you know, would there, could there be any advantages in us doing that? In sending ourselves? No, or in, in sending either bacteria or that creature you showed, just putting it on Mars and see how it survives and, and you know, perhaps introduce some of our life forms onto the planet. Could there be any advantages doing that? Um, uh, okay, so there's lots of different issues you've brought up in that one question. Um, one of the things I would certainly f feel only comfortable with was if we had established that there wasn't life on, a, on Mars, then we could think about um, using it for our own needs. So for me, I would have to feel confident and the rest of the scientific community would have to feel confident there wasn't life on Mars. Once we've done that, we can be begin to think about what they call terraforming uh, life uh, so that means turning Mars into a potential Earth habitat. So that could be somewhere that, that we could live. And if we did that, we'd certainly want to take our own bacteria. That is one of the most important things to make Mars soil uh, fruitful would be to int introduce our Earth bacteria to it to, to help the, the plants grow. So there's certainly advantages. If we want to live on Mars, we are going to have to do that. Um, but I think we have to be a little bit careful how we introduce life uh, onto another planet. Could I thank you all very much for your interest and for your patience. So finally, it's my uh, great pleasure just to, um, on behalf of the Bob Lecture Committee organising team, to thank Dr. Lucy Berthoud for such an inspiring lecture.
We have five more lectures in the series, so please do come along. The next one is 7.30 on Tuesday of next week and is about a cyborg genealogy, the science fiction in the classics. And lastly, I just want to say congratulations to the students who have come from Bristol Vet School. They had a competition in their class to answer the question, is there life on Mars? And the comp competition winners are here today. So congratulations, and I hope that in the future you'll all be astrophysicists. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all for coming.